Welcome to the Sustainable Production Forum. Hath squile, each tenoyup, toits tenat quien quenchamen, cease quien sna, on hath in squalowin, on wanoxed in squalowin titsits. Welcome everybody. It lifts my heart to welcome you to these ancestral lands and waters of the Huamathquiam, the Tesleiwatuth, and the Skolmish Old Olkameo. I am Skolmish and Stalo, and I'm standing on these shorelines where the salt water meets the shoreline and, and comes back into the forest with ancient trees, ancient cedar trees, ancient fir trees, and ancient maples. Welcome, Ocean. It's our job at CBC Radio-Canada to report on what we, as Canadians, care about. Politics, culture, sports, entertainment. But there's a bigger picture, something Canadians care about even more, the environment. It's what all the rest of it hinges on. We wouldn't be here without forests, wildlife, and oceans. Stories on the environment often have a way of making us feel powerless and small. Who are we against a hurricane? Who are we against a wildfire? Who are we against a changing climate? We are more powerful than it seems. So we're not just going to report on the environment. We're going to take action and help preserve all the things we care about. We've looked at how we can do better and set some goals for 2026. And that's just the beginning. Our ultimate goal is carbon neutral. As we move towards zero, we will report on our progress. Keeping you informed is our job, after all. Ontario's film and television industry is committed to a sustainable future. The Ontario Green Screen Initiative is a public-private partnership of industry leaders that have assembled to provide the tools, relationships, resources, and educational opportunities required to make real environmental change. Visit OntarioGreenScreen.ca for more information about how you can take part. Welcome to SPF 22. I'm Zena Harris, president of GreenSpark Group and creative director of the Sustainable Production Forum. Hi, I'm Melanie Windle, executive producer of the Sustainable Production Forum. Thank you for being here with us. I'd like to thank Cease Weiss for that wonderful traditional welcome. I'm tuning in from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, and Pakani, the Sutna Nation, the Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. 
Today, I'm tuning in from the traditional territories of the Puyallup and Coast Salish peoples of the Puget Sound area. This virtual event is coming to you from around the globe. And if you are unsure of whose traditional land you are watching us from, you can visit native-land.ca or indigenousworld.org to learn more. Those links should be popping up in the chat shortly. Please share with us in the chat where you are tuning in from. We are so excited to welcome you back to the seventh annual Sustainable Production Forum. It's a delight to gather again. For the better part of 2022, Zena and I have been discussing your pain points, your successes, and figuring out how we can have an impact and move the needle in decarbonization in our sector. We have been meeting with leaders, experts, change makers, and disruptors for the last six weeks, having incredible conversations, and we are excited to share them with you throughout the month of October. If you have occasion to be in Vancouver, Toronto, or New York City, don't forget to check out our in-person events. Please introduce yourself. We love seeing the community grow. Something special about SPF is that it is a gathering place for stakeholders across the entertainment industry. And we are very grateful for the support, collaboration, and allyship we have developed with our partners. The SPF 22 lead partners are Presenting partner, Real Green, Creative BC, Motion Picture Production Industry Association. Platinum partner, MBS Canada. Signature partners, CBC Radio Canada and Telefilm Canada. Please visit our website or check out our sponsor page on the event platform to get to know all our partners and vendors. A bit of housekeeping. Please take an opportunity to engage with the community board to post or take our polls during sessions. Say hello to our partners and vendors. Please help us gather important measuring points by participating. Join the social media conversation by using the hashtag SPF22. Welcome to Circularity, a modern approach to innovation. We are thrilled you are here to learn about the innovations occurring across the world and how our product systems are being reinvented, propelling us into a new industrial revolution. Guest speakers today, Joy Montgomery, Circular Procurement Specialist for Film and TV, Georg Singer, Innovation and Strategy at ON AG. John Smia, VP of Circularity and Senior Analyst at GreenBiz. And moderating today, Ravi Anupindi, Professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Welcome everyone. Great, thank you for joining us. Um, let's take a minute or two just for uh, our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, let me uh, start with uh, John. Hi, thanks, Ravi. Uh, I'm John Schmea. I lead the circularity program at GreenBiz Group. We're a media and events company. Uh, we put on uh, conferences. Uh, we have a, a website with editorial coverage on green business and sustainability. Uh, I have a background in chemistry and spent about nine years before I came to GreenBiz uh, practicing sustainability in the building products industry. So very happy to be here. Wonderful. Welcome. And uh, Georg? Yeah, thanks, Ravi. Um, yeah, my name is Georg Singer. I'm originally from Austria, but currently based in Switzerland, in Zurich. Um, that's where I work for On Running, the sports shoe and apparel company that you might know. And yeah, I'm working in the innovation business strategy team, dealing a lot with sustainability and circular economy. My background originally or initially was in polymer science and engineering, and then I worked for eight years across different industries in, in R&D positions, and then transferred more towards sustainability, CO2 balancing. And this is one topic that I'm also now heavily involved with my projects at ON. Wonderful. Um, just to kick off the discussion, I think um, it appears that circular economy could mean different things to different people. So I would like to hear from uh, all of you what 
how do you see, how would you define circular economy broadly, but also perhaps bring it to your work context? You know, what would that mean? Uh, start with John. Yeah, uh, this is a big question. I think a lot of people are a little bit confused about this. First of all, I would say a circular economy is not what we have now. <laughs> um, my, my broadest definition would really be decoupling growth from extractive processes. Uh, and this would be through a combination of designing waste and pollution out of our economic system, uh, keeping products and materials in use and at their highest value for as long as possible, and uh, regenerating our, our natural and social systems. So really a, a total overhaul of the way we, we make, sell, and use products. And how would that apply to your context, you know, perhaps a previous job, or if you can elaborate that a little, little bit, some, a couple of examples, right? Yeah, and, and this, is a, this is actually, this will probably be a good, um, a good case study between On and, and the products they make and the products that I used to work with in the building sector. Uh, I was generally dealing with products that had decades uh, lifetime, two, two to five decades uh, in the field. And so circular economy was was a bit more abstract, right? It's it's hard to design a product for recycling or remanufacturing 50 years down the road because you don't know what the technology is going to be. Uh, so a lot of our focus was really on designing for disassembly, uh, designing each component to be either repaired or recycled, um, and then designing out waste in our actual manufacturing processes. So those were those are sort of the big pushes. Um, there's also a lot of work in that space around new business models, sharing models, rental models, things like that. Uh, in my current context at GreenBiz, uh, our, our customers, if you will, are the largest corporations in the world. So really dealing across all sectors, whether that's plastics and packaging, uh, tech, apparel, uh, what have you, and, and really helping them giving them the, the base knowledge and the networking capability to learn what others are doing and implement circular economy strategy at their own companies. Wonderful. Uh, Georg, uh, your, your view of what CE is or circular economy is, and maybe you've got some examples here. Yes, sure. Also, thanks to John for, for, for your view. It's very interesting. And I see also some overlapping topics for sure. And um, yes, for, for me personally, or also for us at ON, we're really looking nowadays at a very linear setup in, in all the, the, the business that we are doing. And yes, for, for us, it's really the way of how can we make sure to keep the resources, the material that we are actually putting into our products in the loop, like bringing, keeping these materials um, in like circulating and without landfilling and incineration at the end of the day, because um, these materials at the end of their useful product lifetime still have a value. And that's something that we are trying to capture and where we also see a lot of challenges um, to, to kind of bend this linear uh, chain into a circle. That's one yeah. big challenge that we're facing. And I think for that, it also requires a lot of understanding in the society and, and the participation of every one of us. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, the last step that you said, could you uh, push that a little bit further about specifically what kinds of things have you been trying to do to so-called bend the linear curve and make it more and more circular? If we take a supply chain perspective, right? So end-to-end -end supply chain from materials, John, you talked about, <clears throat> you know, decoupling growth from extractive processes. Because what I say in my class typically is that all supply chains typically end up in mother nature, right? Either uh, on top of a tree or under the ground or in the water or somewhere, right? So you're extracting something. So from that, so if you take an end-to-end -end supply chain perspective and then Talk about this bending the curve because you can bend the curve in many different points. So how do we, you know, how, you know, would love to hear from you. Let me start, uh, Georg, with you from the products that you're dealing with. You know, what are the kinds of so-called bending you're thinking about? Uh, and then we'll come to, you know, what challenges are you facing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Very interesting. Um, because, for example, a running shoe is 
as we heard from John before from the construction industry that we are looking at decades of, of lifetime. A running shoe generally lasts for, let's say 500 kilometers, maybe half a year if you're a serious runner and then you're basically throwing it away. Um, and we just launched actually a very revolutionary product and model where we offer a subscription of a running shoe, which is the shoe that you will never own. You pay a monthly fee. It's like the Netflix of, of running. Uh, you pay a monthly fee. And after you, you've worn out the shoe, you just receive a new one, put the old shoe into the same packaging that you received the new one with and send it back to us. So we're really making sure with this, uh, you were talking about bending the, the chain, basically. And this is where we make sure through the subscription that we actually get our product back because for us, it's still a resource. We can mechanically recycle this shoe and use the material again for the production of, of a new product, of a new shoe. And this was, this is a, a great project, a great feasibility study, so to say, um, that right. shows on the one hand that it's possible and on the other hand shows us also the challenges that, that we are facing by doing so. Right. No, no, that's that's a great, and we will. We'll, I want to come back and pick up on this idea because you talked about changing the business model from ownership to a subscription, etc. John, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps you know, go back and, and talk a little bit more about using maybe perhaps a couple of examples. Where do you see as depending on the industry? I think different industries might try to bend this at different points in the supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I think as as we think about a circular economy, right? It's actually it's actually a number of circles, right? It's not just one circle. And and if you're thinking, uh, actually, one second here. Uh, I I actually have Georg shoes oh, no. here. I've been running it oh. for about a month now. Um, Very nice. But you know, you think about this cycle, and what what An is trying to do is actually is do a closed loop shoe back right. to shoe, same shoe company same company keeping ownership right so that's sort of um what you might think as a, think of as a tight loop uh where mm -hmm. it, it's really trying to be maintained within one one small supply chain um of course not every product can can really fit into that small circle right so then we've got these wider circles of you know for durable products do you have good uh remanufacturing and repair sure. cycles uh for you know, for textiles, maybe it's a wider chain because they have to be sent back and recycled and reformulated into new yarns. Um, so we're thinking really about these these various circles, and they might be wider and they might be smaller. And obviously, in a in a perfect world, the smaller the circles, the better, because then you're also decreasing the impact of getting those products back and reusing them. They have to be touched by less people, uh, go through less less cycles. So. Really, you know, as I think about the the bigger the bigger goal here, it's to you know it it goes back to that highest and best use. Can we create products where the materials within them ultimately can go back to the same use um, or a better use? Uh, but the same use is great, right? So many things that we do now are actually being downcycled into less valuable products, um, and so that's we're seeing some some really cool examples of that like on trying trying the subscription shoe, shoe service um we're seeing a lot of resale platforms for for textiles and clothing um and you know so there's there's some exciting things there but uh as, as i said earlier we're really far from circular now right we're at less than 10 percent uh globally so there's a lot of work to be done wonderful yeah so let, let me come back to georg you talked about um, two issues, right? So one is the business model. I think what John highlighted is the the length of the so circumference of the circle, if you will, right? A short circle versus a very long circle. And the second point, John, you're making is, is it re being the circle goes back to the same product or a similar product to the same company? Obviously, I mean that's one way to think about this. Or it goes to a one of the different kind of stakeholders, whether it is downgrading, upgrading, or whatever. And that presents uh, some, some issues and challenges. But let me start with, when you think about Georg in terms of you know, bringing it back through a business model innovation, bringing it back into your own system, but that implies that you need to rethink the design to be able to use not virgin material, 
but recycled material into your product design process. Exactly, and this is a very, very important point um, where we are also working very closely with our design team. And we also have within our innovation team, we have designers uh, and footwear engineers that are really working on how to implement those kind of materials into our shoes, but more so actually it's about how to design a shoe that we can at the end of the day recover the material because if you look at the, the running shoe today there are so many different materials that go into that shoe there it, it is glued and at the end of the day the challenge is how to get it apart right so i would say maybe it's it's the how to use a recycled material if you look into chemically recycled materials um the assumption is that that, or it's, it's a fact that we actually receive version like materials so we can use it as we are used to use these type of materials but then we need to make sure that if we for example use a polyamide and a polyester in one product that at the end of the day we can actually separate it again to recover those materials this is one approach the other approach that we have seen uh, with the cloud neo the shoe that john just uh, showed us thanks for that <laughs> um, where we managed, and this goes maybe more into the design part, where we managed to come up with a shoe that is built out of a mono material. So this entire shoe is only based on polyamide, one type of polymer, um, which allows us to recycle the shoe without disassembling it. Right, right. So that's that's great. So. I think this you're connecting it back to what uh, John was mentioning earlier in terms of design for, you said, disassembly, which is mm -hmm. if it's an assembled product, but designed for recycling kind of idea, right? Uh, or designed for reuse, uh, so, you know, many of those terms we could. How, so Georg, I'm just curious, what motivated your company to start on this journey? Um, I think many, many, many reasons actually, but since we are a very young company, we, we were founded in 2010 and our founders came up with the idea of building this company during a walk or a hike in the Swiss, Swiss Alps, surrounded by beautiful nature. So the brand itself is rooted in, in the outdoors, in nature, and this is something that, that is really important to all of us and we want to preserve so this is we can really see that also in among all, all our colleagues all the colleagues that joined on that sustainability is a topic that we're taking very seriously and that's also the reason why we have very very strict um, material selection criteria where we are for example we we don't want to work with materials that are bio-based but competing with the food chain which limits ourselves already quite a bit uh, in terms of selection and, and, and materials available and we have set the goal for ourselves to be a circular co a company by the end of the decade which is a very ambitious goal uh, not much time left and i think this is also the reason that we or, or yeah this is the picture that we convey towards the outside basically and attracts also talent and people that that feels passionate about uh, sustainability circularity and that's why we are pushing so hard also in that direction and getting things done that's if wonderful could... to, yeah that's wonderful oh. to hear uh, john i mean i just uh, this there, there was a reason i asked this because you know as green biz group you interact with many other companies what are you seeing because there is the type of company on that Jörg is talking about you know patagonia and other kind of companies come in that you know, uh, segment, yeah. but there are lots of other companies, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, uh, that appeal to the mass market or not, you know, what are you seeing? What, what is motivating people to go in that direction? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was just going to uh, add on to what Georg said and just talk about how important it is that companies like on are willing to take risks because it, sh it, it can show some of the more established companies uh, what benefits there are to taking those risks and and in some cases teach people uh, where, where the hurdles might be. Um, and so it's really exciting to see that. But if, as we look, I guess, at the, the sort of broader economy, I think there's a number of reasons that that companies are are thinking more about circularity. 
um, you know, one, one is really investor pressure. Uh, we're hearing from a lot of the companies we work with that their investors want them to be more sustainable, less extractive. Uh, it's almost becoming a license to operate for them going into the future. Uh, and, you know, for a long time, that was really around things like like carbon and, and energy use and water use. Now it's it's really expanding larger um, into the circular economy space. So we're, we're definitely hearing that from the companies we work with. Uh, another thing that we're hearing is this is long-term a risk mitigation strategy. If they can if they can stop extracting new materials and use the materials that are already in their supply chains, uh, it just mitigates risk against supply chain disruptions, uh, whether that's due to climate change or global pandemics or what have you. I think a lot of companies are looking at this um, as sort of a a hedge uh, for the future, especially those companies um, that use things like plastics, wood, uh, glass, which are most companies these days. Uh, they're they're just seeing these disruptions year over year, and trying to find ways to get around it. And then I think sort of the third, the third major thing we're hearing is that long term companies feel like there's a big there's a big economic incentive to doing this. Right? They can. Mm -hmm. If they can keep these materials in circulation longer, um, it can ultimately save costs for them. It might be able to allow them to grow market share. Uh, so there's definitely an, uh, an economic angle here. And as we see, right, the being a first mover can be more expensive. But if you get it right, um, I think I think there's big um, big economic upside in the future uh, to doing this properly. So those are the three major things that I'm seeing. Um, right now out there from the companies we talk to. Wonderful. But that transition is going to be, I would imagine, much slower. So you talked about, for example, and one of the things that I hear is, you know, your, your company's case is different and we'll come back to this business model that allows you to bring your own products back into the system. But what I was talking about earlier in terms of designing and materials substitution, if you will, between virgin and recycle, right? You know, if I'm, if I don't own the entire circular economy, when I mean own like what you're, you're doing through subscription model, right? Then I'm relying on something else for that to come back, right? And you're talking about right now, for example, take plastics, right? So should I go virgin plastic or should I go recycled plastic? Well, that depends. If you just based on economics of it with the price of oil, right? what is the price of the virgin plastic pallets that I can take versus what's the recycled stuff? Even if I have access to it, you know, that could shift how people would use the material into their product design, right? So that's one. Second, as Georg in your company, you know, you would have seen that if you're going to mix material like this, recycled, it requires a fundamentally different way to think about design. Right, because the properties of a virgin material may be very different than the properties of a recycled material, unless through some magical chemical process, you're exactly getting the virgin material properties back. Right, so I hear some of that stuff also challenges in large organization. Oh, do I need to redesign this stuff? Well, there's a design piece, but there's a sourcing piece, right? You know, if I look at the access to virgin material versus access to recycled materials, you know, what are the economics of that? And how is that going to change? You know, could you speak to that a little bit, John, about what are some of the challenges there? Yeah, yeah you, you touched on a lot of them, right? The, I think one, one way I always like to think about this is in contrast to, let's say, renewable energy uh, procurement, right? So if I'm, a, if I'm a large company and I want to procure renewable energy, it's it's most it's mostly a financial and contractual right. Uh, agreement, right? I go out, I find somebody that can build that for me. I sign on, and now I have renewable energy credits. Uh, and, and and it's sort of a, it can be a bolt on. I think when it comes to circular economy, it's really a much bigger disruption to the way businesses operate in general. Um, and so there there's a lot of there's a lot of struggle within large companies right now, and even across them to say like. You know how do we do this? I can't source the the PET I need to make my bottles 100% recycled because it has to be food grade and the supply chain's not there and the supply chain's variable. Um, 
so I think what we're I think what we're really pushing towards or what we need to see in the future is we need to see more um, more work upstream in these material uh, manufacturing supply chains, whether that's the Dow, BASF, Eastman's of the world, um, you know, sort of pushing to incorporate more recycled content into the materials that they're selling their customers. Uh, or if that's new suppliers disrupting the current chains. But right now, you're 100% correct. If I want to source recycled glass for a window uh, in my last job, it's not possible, right? There's there's nobody out there that'll sell me recycled glass for my window. Um, so I'm stuck with what I can get for the time being. So to me, the biggest challenge is the supply chain. And the biggest solution to that challenge is a slow and steady push from customers from product manufacturers up the chain to make companies uh, to make companies change their business model in order to do business uh, in this this new economy. Uh, I wish I had a better answer, but yeah, it, it's no. it's going to be a slow transition, right? It's not. I don't think it's anything we can do in the next five years. Um, so yeah, that's it's and and uh, yeah, no thanks. Uh, you know, it is challenging, and it, I think I would like to connect this back to Georg, what you said about your business model because. You know, this discussion response that John just mentioned comes back to any company that is wanting to make this transition. How do I get access to that recycled material that I could put back into my product design, right? Now, you could do what you, one could do what you are doing, which is the subscription model. Is the subscription model, for example, then it's a different business model. Is it primarily focus to ensure access to the materials that you put there so that it comes back to you rather than you go into the market and trying to find recycled material like what John was saying, say for windows, well, you know, whoever is installing the windows, unless uh, I don't recall if it's Anderson John, but let's suppose Anderson Windows basically says, has a subscription model on windows, let's say, I don't know if they do, right? Has a subscription model windows and then somehow I can get it back. You don't have to have a subscription model. You could have other ways to incentivize the return of the product. And, and many different models have been tried, many unsuccessful, right? So uh, Georg, I would like you to kind of talk a little bit about you chose a subscription model. Why is that? Because is the primary driver the access to raw materials that are going back? And of course, you know, moving you towards circularity what could be other alternate models and what mm -hmm. may be some challenges in, in, in getting that access, yeah. Yes, of course. I think you, you touched upon some several very important points here. Um, as we, of course we could say, we don't, we don't care about our own product coming back. Um, I think many brands also are focusing more on production waste, for example, because it's easier to access mm -hmm. it. And, we have looked at many different uh, circular business models as well. And the biggest challenge for all of these models was how to get the product back if you really want to keep it in the loop. So what you can do, you can go by a mass balance approach and say you are right. sourcing the material somewhere else. You produce your product using recycled material, but then at the end of the day, it would still potentially end up in, in a landfill or incineration. And, and this is also what we see in the, in the textile and footwear industry that, especially in the textile industry, so many brands are, are going, going for recycled polyester materials, but where do they source them? From the bottle industry. So we're actually a, like taking material out of an existing loop already and it's it's kind of a war for recycled material at the moment on like where where can we source it, and th that's what also this transition that John talked about like how can we make sure that a, a textile company takes responsibility of their own product and finds a technological way also to to recycle a textile and not a bottle because we are producing textile so we should also look into how can we recover these textile materials and this is something that might or at least in the European Union we're, we're seeing now more and more around extended producer responsibility and 
at the end of the day, regulations coming up on the horizon that will require companies actually to, to take care of their own materials in order to, to foster such a transition and to speed it up. Um, if it's not economically uh, incentivized for a, for a company, then often regulation is a useful mean to, to point companies yeah. into the right direction. Yeah. Right, right. I'm so glad you raised the word responsibility because one of the things I talk about, you know, end-to-end -end sustainability, we could debate endlessly, but we could at least come up with some list of what sustainability actually means, whether on the planet side or people side, et cetera. The other piece that never gets talked about or rarely gets talked about is, even if you can come, if, even if you can agree to what sustainability means, well, whose responsibility is it in the end-to-end -end supply chain to ensure that we get to that sustainability? In this case, let's say we get to the circular economy. So I'm, I'm really glad you raised the issue of responsibility because that gets to, you know, incentives, but also financing, right? Because take packaging, right? I mean, I could be extremely innovative in packaging come up with all kinds of fancy packaging as a brand and put the product in there. Well, I don't care. It's the city who's going to recycle it somehow. Well, how? Who's going to pay for it? Whose responsibility is it? Now, you are injecting into that, uh, your a business model through subscription, you're creating your own loop. Now, that cannot be the only solution is what I would hypothesize because imagine how many products we consume or use if every company decided to do their own circular stuff. I mean, that would be a mess, wouldn't it be, yes. right? So I, I'm just going to see. So it's interesting that, you know, it's important that you're raising this whole notion of producer responsibility that comes to, you know, ultimately who's responsible for actually you know, closing the loop in some ways, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so subscription is is one way. You talked about EPR, but EPR has a very, I mean, Europe has moved. And in fact, you also talked about another thing, Georg, that I picked up, which is the mix of material. I think I saw last week, there was some kind of uh, in EU coming out that textiles, because of the mix of different materials going in there, it's becoming super hard to extract the original you know, either it's cotton or the polyester yarn to be extracted out. I thought there was EU is going to begin to do something about not having too much of mixed material and things like that. So the extraction becomes easy. EU is different. There's a lot of regulation that goes on that you could impose. But uh, John, I mean, what's the situation in the United States? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the, the situation in the United States is really complicated right now, right? We have states that are implementing their own EPR laws. Um, the the federal level, there's there's really not much happening at all other than some bills moving through to try to um, to try to push for more recycling infrastructure. Um, it's interesting. I was just uh, last week in India uh, visiting some waste collection and sorting facilities. Um, with one of our partners at GreenBiz. Um, and, you know, they have an EPR law uh, on the books. It's a stringent EPR law, but very few people are participating in it because yep. there's a feeling that it's very corrupt, right? So I think there's this, there's this disconnect in most, in most of the world right now between the law, how it's implemented, or the lack thereof. And the U.S. is, is currently struggling from a lack of, a lack of good regulatory um, movement on this EPR front. Uh, and, and when I think about, it's funny, when I think about responsibility, um, I, I like to think that the, the responsibility is on the companies and the sectors to create systems that consumers or users of products can participate in easily, right? Um, we have the luxury, the, you know, the, the people on this call have the luxury to think about how our own impact, right? Not everybody has that luxury. So I feel like there is a huge onus on companies and sectors to really figure the system out so that people can participate without too much pain um, and without having to sort of unlearn the way they do things now. Um, and and yeah, so the, the regulatory framework has to be part of that, I think. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll see a little bit more movement, you know, in, in the US, for example, if, if California comes up with a good EPR law, 
it's entirely likely that that will spread uh, to some degree um, across the U.S. So really, really thinking about um, the future there is, is in some ways, I, I usually don't say exciting when it comes to laws, but uh, it could be exciting if it's done right in, in certain parts of the world. Right. I mean, uh, interesting you raised that. Uh, you know, I did a case study uh, on uh, in the for the United States uh, beverage carton recycling, the Tetra Pak kind of thing. I'm, I'm, Tetra Pak is of course one company, but mm -hmm. but the idea of that beverage carton, and it's interesting, uh, John. You talk about that the industry has to come together because what they realized is it's not just one company's. Uh, you know, one company cannot do it because you have to rebuild the recycling infrastructure. And so they they built a consortium, same industry sector consortium, to work with the waste management industry, to work with the city municipalities to figure out how to improve access to recycling for the citizens in different communities. So that's an example of where even without regulation, we can't wait for regulation. I think the point that you're making is we can't wait for regulation necessarily because different countries are at different levels, even if I have regulation, implementation is a challenge. Mm -hmm. What could industry or groups do to move, you know, make it easy, as you say, for the consumers to improve access to recycling, right? So where it is not one company doing it, it is the, you know, it's just moving through in a linear supply chain. How do we kind of make sure it somehow comes back. So uh, I don't, so this has been a great discussion. I want to close with a few questions from you, right? So uh, maybe Georg, I know you guys are doing great work in terms of your circularity. Which other company or industry you look up to think these guys are doing great? <laughs> or are you but, saying that you are the best? I'm clearly not saying that we're the best. Um, okay. We are, I think we are pioneers um, with sure. the advantage that we are still small and we can afford to be flexible and fast. But of course, since we are in the sportswear and also in our outdoor industry, uh, Patagonia, for example, is a brand that we clearly look up to. I mean, we have all seen lately also on the news what, what just happened. Yeah. And maybe this is also an, a very important point that you mentioned, like the responsibility of the sector. So we were talking now about our subscription model, but this is not how we see the, the solution for each brand to have their own loop. So we are clearly partnering with other brands in the industry on technologies and ways how to collaborate, because we clearly see it at the end of the day as a shared effort of an entire industry or sector, or even across industries, because we just also have launched a, a shoe that is actually where the, the polymer, the foam, um, one of the components is CO off gas from industrial off gases. And this is captured and then um, a polymer is produced out of that. And this is a way where we can leverage not even our own sector, but across industries and collaborate together. And I think, um, this is something where, where there are many companies out there where we can learn from. And at the end of the day, it will be a collaborative effort to, to solve circularity. Wonderful, Georg. John, uh, any particular industry or company sectors that you think are kind of leaders and far ahead? I mean, of course, yeah. you know, it looks like you're a fan of ON, so you already uh, <laughs> pitched the product, but other than them, yeah. Yeah, um, actually, I'd never run an ONS before I got this pair of shoes, but I was so excited about the the model that I decided to give them a try. Um, there's, you know, I think there's some really good examples. Uh, unfortunately, there's not enough great examples of of sort of full implementation, right, at scale. So there's, you know, Philips is doing some really interesting things with lighting as a service, um, where they maintain ownership of of all the lighting fixtures and bulbs, things like that, so that they can bring them back and remanufacture. Um, there's some really good work going on in the tech space, whether that's phones or computers with repair, recycling, uh, and remanufacturing of products. I think they're they're sort of early on in that, but you know, you think of of Dell and HP and and Apple all doing work around how to get their products back and recycle them properly. Um, 
And then, uh, you know, there's some material manufacturers that are doing some good work here too. If you think of uh, the aluminum company, Novellus is working really hard to increase their recycled content. They're investing in, in clean aluminum and, and ways to produce aluminum um, without so many emissions. Uh, again, you know, these examples are starting to bubble up um, and we're starting to see a lot more uh, momentum around CE, but I think I think there's there's still a long way to go um, until we see companies like on and and Georg mentioned sort of fully circular, right? Uh, we we don't have a lot of good examples of that yet, um, but it feels like we're on our way. Yeah, wonderful. I think one uh, one question I have for Georg because one question triggered based on what you just said, uh, Philip's example. So I'm curious, uh, uh, Georg. So your subscription model. Uh, is this uh, like a monthly fee or do you go one step further to say, we will charge you based on the number of steps that you run? That's actually a, a very good idea. At the moment, uh, it's, it's a <laughs> it's, no, at the moment, it's a monthly fee, of course. <laughs> okay. And yeah. What we also see as a challenge with circular economy and a subscription model or is basically how can we actually reduce consumption at the same time keeping materials in the loop and, and incentivize the consumer to bring it back? Does that actually trigger more consumption than it would otherwise? And even though we are circular, we might be using more materials at the end of the day. So I think there are exactly. so many dimensions you have to think into yeah. at the end of the day to really assess is a circular economy the solution or a smart linear way or like a combination of, of both? And, of and I think this will be very interesting to yeah. explore further. Yeah. Wonderful. I think we're almost out of time. So just to close, I would love each one of you, uh, you know, start with John. What are some closing thoughts on, on this whole topic of circular economy? You know, to our audience, what would you want to convey as a, some final thoughts? Yeah, I think... I, I hope if there's a couple things that we got across today um, in this discussion, you know, one, it's it's that that no one company can do this alone. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it matters how big you are. <laughs> um, there's really there's really not only no opportunity to do it alone, but also not a lot of benefit in doing it alone. So I would encourage you know collaboration across industries, uh, across sectors, um, and really getting creative about these supply chains. And then the second thing I really want to get across, and I, and I think this is this has also been stated today, it's not only about product design, right? Yeah. It's a combination of product design, material selection, business models, mm -hmm. uh, new ways of engaging with customers. Um, it really is a total disruption to the system. Um, right. And, and I, I hope people uh, sort of recognize that and take on the challenge uh, in a way that that meets that that meets that yeah. big scope mm -hmm. yeah no that's great yeah Georg? great yeah thanks john for for mentioning that i think that was also very very good thoughts and i i also would say that of course it won't be a a or a solution that one company will solve it will be cross industry course company collaborative and what we have seen is that it's definitely worth to start as small as you can. Like, yeah. this, don't be overwhelmed by the circularity. I mean, we we have experienced as a like producing company, we are normally focusing only on our tier one suppliers in terms of supply chain. But when you mm -hmm. go circular, um, that's what John mentioned. You have to look at this entire universe and really go to the beginning of your supply chain to engage with the suppliers start the conversation. And that's also what we have seen that everybody is excited to be part of it. Um, you just have to kick it off. And this can be a small project uh, that gets bigger over time, just shows you also the challenges that you need to tackle. And right. this is also why we uh, launched the subscription model because it was a way that we can actually cover this entire circle for once. And this is something now we can we can build upon and we can see which products makes make sense as a subscription mm -hmm. and which products um, are maybe a one-off fee but still part of a circular supply chain and that's when 
things get rolling and, and, and we move forward. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, John and Georg. This has been a great discussion. As I take away, you know, a few th words come to my mind, end-to-end, -end, responsibility, and in the end-to-end, -end, basically, it's all kinds of things, design, but supply chain design, design of the product, supply chain design, but also think about, you know, new business models. And as I tell in my class, you know, the, the forward supply chain is generally, even though people think it's difficult, it's actually easier than thinking about the reverse supply chain, right? That, that, that is what makes this extremely complex, but that's also what, why it makes it super interesting for all of us uh, you know, to engage and for more smarter people to come in and, and, and contribute to this. So it's been a pleasure uh, you know, uh, having you on this panel and, and this uh, excellent discussion. Uh, I'm sure this is a very, very big topic. So uh, there are many other things to, to talk about. Hopefully, you know, we will we will feature this another time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ravi. Thank you very much. It was super interesting. Thank you. At SPF, we like to keep it fresh and we like to innovate. And when something came up for Joy Montgomery and she couldn't join us for our initial recording, we decided to do something different. So we shared that chat with her and then she's created this unique presentation for us here at SPF in response to that chat. So here we go. Here's Joy Montgomery, founder on screen, circular procurement expert. Over to you, Joy. Hello, and welcome to SPF 22. Um, I'm just gonna to talk to you today a little bit about how I view and how I use circularity within the film and TV industry. And to demonstrate that I've put together um, a little presentation. So I'll just share my screen. Um, so I'm Joy Montgomery, and I am the founder of On Screen, and we source production materials for use in front of and behind the camera. Um, since 2010, I've been working with lots of different departments within productions. First of all, it was producers and getting gifts for the cast when they arrived on set. And then slowly I progressed to working with costume designers and set decorators who have limited budgets, but perhaps need to buy high ticket priced items. And because I've got a lot of PR and brand contacts, I can go directly to them and negotiate deals. So I can go to a designer and say, can you lend us this very expensive dress rather than us having to buy it? Um, and then that way that saves uh, money for the costume designer, um, but also has turned out to be a great way to be a bit more circular as well. Um, I've been really lucky. I've worked on some amazing films and TV shows. And um, I, I love the fact that now it seems to be the conversation has definitely moved from just sourcing products to, okay, what are we gonna do with them afterwards? Um, so as I was saying before, uh, primarily my role is to source products for these different departments. Um, I'm always amazed when I speak to people and say, oh, I source products for costume. And they always look at me like, don't the actors just turn up in their own clothes? Um, <laughs> so, which also I probably thought myself before I started it, but I help with everything from bags, jewelry, clothes, shoes, luggage, everything you can think of. Um, and the same for set. I would say in the last couple of years, two, three years, perhaps, um, we've definitely started to think about, okay, we, we secure a lot of products for productions. What happens to them after wrap? We hadn't really thought about that before, um, but when we did start thinking about it, we thought, well, we can't be part of the problem. We have to be part of the solution. So we thought, right, well, maybe we'll offer a way to, to do something with those products at the end of um, filming. So uh, for instance, on Atlanta, which they filmed in Europe this year, uh, London, Paris, and Amsterdam, um, we made sure that we got to lend most of the designer products that they needed. Um, with the idea was that we could then return those products when we wrap. So there's no need for any kind of waste. There's no need to even think about storage. You can just send them back to the designer and they go back into circularity because the 
the PR people will be lending them out to um, editorials, to magazines, to red carpet. So that one dress can stay in circulation, which is amazing. So we've kind of found a way to save the production's money and also minimize waste and storage costs. Um, one of the questions was, how would you define the circular economy? There's lots of different views out there, just as there is with sustainability. Um, but the main thing that I've taken from it is that um, prior to circular, the circular economy, the linear economy was basically, we would take uh, resources, make something from them, and then dispose of them. And that really was just the journey that we thought about or what um, pro producers, as in you know, people who produce the products, what they thought about. With a circular economy, it's more about thinking, okay, we're gonna make this product, but what's going to happen to it at the end of its life? How can we extend that? How can we keep it in circulation as much as possible? On set, um, when I'm working with costume or props, what I try and do is get involved with them very early in prep. Um, Pre-production, there's always a little bit of time for you to suggest things and recommend things. If you wait until wrap, no one's interested. Everyone just wants to get off the production and move on to the next thing. No one's interested in recycling or rehousing or reusing anything. So when I have my first meeting with those departments, I kind of come up with some ideas of what we could do. Um, so for instance, um, there's SmartWorks, which is a charity that I really love, and they help women who are returning to the workplace, have to go for a job interview, but don't have the budget or the money to buy like a nice suit or a nice outfit, or even if they get the job, worry about, well, how am I, I don't have the clothes to, to wear to the job. So SmartWorks helps them, addresses them for the interview and for the, I think their first month of working um, all free and also trains them on interview techniques and all that. So what I like to do is if relevant clothing, so if we have, a, if I'm working on something in the suits or jackets or briefcases or anything that might work for an interview, um, we can always donate it to SmartWorks um, and they can, they can then distribute it to, to women who really need it. Um, rent, don't buy, you know, as much as possible. I try and get loans, or I've even kind of moved into going to fashion rental companies for some of the, um, we needed a Birkin bag on a certain film and Hermes were not interested in lending it to us. And they cost 30,000 plus upwards. So um, I found a company that rents them and we were able to rent it for a three month shoot, I think for 500 pounds, which was amazing. Um, and it was a genuine Birkin and it was perfect. So I was trying to think about what can we do to not have to hang on to this at the end of filming? What are the challenges? The challenges are everyone is so busy. So even when I'm in prep and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, discussing what we can do in regards to, can we base, buy sustainable brands? Can we use products from sustainable brands to what we're going to do with them afterwards? Um, when we come to sort of starting, getting closer and closer to principal photography, a lot of it goes out the window. And the other thing I find is that, although I've worked on productions where I know there's a green steward, I never meet them. And I never get any kind of plan sent to me to say, oh, this is what's being discussed and this is what each department needs to adhere to. So I think there's definitely a disconnect between um, a green consultant coming on and putting together a plan, a strategy, recommendations, advice, and having this great document um, and it actually getting implemented on set. Uh, the other thing I find is a lot of people, not so much now, but definitely when I first started a couple of years ago was the cost implication. Is it going to be more expensive for us if we go the sustainable route? Um, how can I trust these brands? Uh, for a film industry that's very forward thinking, when it comes to using new things or new services, or we're very reluctant. And so to try and get someone to, uh, to kind of change the way they've done something can be very difficult. 
but I definitely think it's more about having that plan than not actually having it implemented. Where do you find sustainable products? Um, I have a lot of go-to places. Albert has the costume directory um, and that's a really good starting place because they've done a lot of the hard work for you. They've kind of checked them out. They've made sure that they're not greenwashing, that everything that they say they do, that they're, they're doing. And there's a kind of nice variety of different brands, materials, uh, lots of things that you could need for costumes. So it's not just clothing. There's kind of a nice variety, but I have to look on there. Then Good On You is an app. It's, a, it's an amazing app, but they're very, I don't want to say brutal, they're very forthright. So they don't just look at a brand in regards to well, what materials do you use and um, are, is everything sustainably produced? They look at how do they treat their workforce? Um, how much are they paying their people? Where are they getting their materials from? They're really thorough. Um, but it's a great place just to go in, type the name of a brand and it'll come up with kind of a, a list of different criteria that they put together on whether or not they think it's great, good, could be doing better, don't even try it. That's a really good one. Uh, Green Production Guide, if I'm thinking about the US, they also have a lot of recommendations, which is really good. Um, Albert has a great supplier list um, that they've got online that you can use for props as well. Um, it's not so much clothing, but it's much more like scenes and wood and, that kind of supplier. Um, Cocoon is where I go if I'm looking for a really expensive bag and I want to rent it. Um, even I, I, I use it for myself. I'm going out for a weekend. I want to have a latest bag. I rent it for that weekend, four days, I think it is. Um, and then I return it because who wants to have the same bag on a second day? Nobody. Um, my wardrobe HQ, they rent clothes and very high end. So um, if you were looking for design addresses, um, that's a really good place to go and see if you can rent it. The only difficulty we have with renting clothes is if costume needs more than one dress, so sometimes they might need two or three, or if they need to distress them or any way, um, you know, or sometimes it can be the length of time. Like sometimes we might need to rent a dress for three to six months and they can't do that. But if it's something where you know you can shoot with that dress and then it's fine, a very quick thing, they're really good for, for designer wear. And wood recycling, um, that's a great place as well because also for the end, for sets, you can send it to them and they'll recycle it as well as going to them to buy uh, new, new stuff for props as well. What motivated me to start this journey? Um, Greta obviously was one of those kind of like, oh my goodness, there's a 15 year old telling us what to do, how embarrassing is this? Um, and when I started looking into it more and I discovered Albert and then started looking at the stats, I was like, oh my God, you don't, it hadn't even crossed my mind to think about carbon emissions. And I, and I say that with no pleasure, but hadn't really crossed my mind to think about what we were doing as an entertainment industry to the planet. I hadn't really thought about it, but once you see it, it's like anything, once you know, there's no going back. Um, and then also I'm mother to two boys and you know I do think about, well, what am I leaving behind for them? What kind of earth are they going to inherit? What's going to be, what am I gonna say that my part in all of this was? You know, So those were kind of the, the uh, motivations. And then just kind of being swept up with everyone else. There's so many people trying to make a difference, you know? Um, that it's kind of infectious and you kind of think, yeah. And then once you start, you can't really stop. But um, yeah, those were my initial motivations. Who do I look up to? Um, I should have put SPF in there, I shouldn't mind what you mean. But um, in the UK, um, Albert, I think because uh, they were one of the first organizations I found that was trying to do something about sustainability and reducing carbon emissions. And I followed them sort of from their very early days to where they are now. And I really love the fact that they've um, joined up with Fremantle, which is one of the biggest TV producers here in, in the UK, or globally, they've got global offices. And they've created a global carbon calculator that TV productions can use wherever they are, which is amazing because as much as it's great us looking at ourselves 
independently. This really is going to take all of us. It really is a global problem. Um, so I like the fact that um, they're kind of looking bigger and also trying to scale at pace because the other thing that worries me is, are we doing things quick enough? Um, Louise Smith, at the sustainability consultancy, um, she's a great one. She's kind of one of those pioneers, I think, was working on sets, talking to the different departments about recycling waste um, years before I can remember anyone talking about it. And also Amelia Price from Neptune Environmental Solutions. You know, they've kind of um, been the sort of people who were pioneering for me when I looked at people. And they have actually, you know, whereas I've taken an interest in this and I'm trying to do the best that I can do within my departments that I work with, they've actually like really studied and, you know, they're, they're I would say they're experts. Um, and so I, I follow them and, and I work on a lot of um, productions where they are as well. So I'm always really impressed with them. And Patagonia, of course, can't go without mentioning them. I mean, really, they walk the walk, don't they? And that's what we need more of. So that's kind of where I am at the moment. My next stage is thinking of um, developing a concierge service that would implement any of the sustainable strategies that the consultants put together on set. Because I think if, if we can take that onus of responsibility from the crew, trying to get them to do everything, I think it needs like a third party to say, right, give us, give us the recommendations, what you want us to do, and we will do it. Um, and then they, you know, the crew can just get on with making a great production, but knowing that in the background, everything's being done. So that's kind of my uh, next thing that I'm planning on doing. But thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at joy at jm-london.com. Thank you. And thank you to SPF22 for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much. <laughs>